you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, we are more than halfway through the book of Revelation. Today I want to talk to you about the triumphant saints. The triumphant saints. If you have a bulletin and you want to follow along with us and want to make some notes, you're welcome to do that. Number one, the song of the 144,000. The song of the 144,000. And, uh, you know, Steve, that's what heaven's going to be like. We're just going to sing and sing and sing and then sing some more. Number two, the message of three angels. God uses angels to speak. They are messengers, and we need to listen to God's messengers. Sometimes it's through the Holy Spirit, and most of the time it is. But every once in a while, God uh, supernaturally helps us. And, and again, I'm not saying I've visibly seen angels, but I'm simply saying I believe everyone has a guardian angel, and I believe that that angel takes care of us. He is assigned to us, and he is a messenger to us. And number three, the patience of the saints. The patience of the saints. You know, the opening verses of Revelation 14 introduce the most triumphant group of men the world will ever know. Scripture de describes other faithful, godly, uncompromising, committed men like Joseph, Daniel, and the Apostle Paul. But never will there be such a large group at one time. They will emerge from the worst holocaust in history, the tribulation, battle-weary but triumphant. They will be like 144,000 Daniels. They will survive Satan's wrath and persecution, plus God's judgments on earth to the sinful, to sinful mankind. Nothing will be able to harm them because God seals them with his seal. They are another example of God protecting those who belong to him. Revelation 14 uh, returns to what God is doing. It contains three visions that give us a preview of the judgments to come uh, that will culminate in Christ's return. Let's look at this scripture, which speaks of truth, righteousness, purity, and praise. The song of the 144, Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked ten times in the book of Revelation. You will see that phrase. John sees a vision. John is looking. And behold, a lamb. Capital L, it, it's so obvious we are talking about Jesus Christ standing on Mount Zion. And when we think of Mount Zion, there's only two choices here. And I will say the, the commentaries that I've read, they were split right down the middle. Some of them thought the Mount Zion was heaven, but my personal opinion is that it was here on earth. And the reason I say that is if the 144 was in heaven, they would have died. Well, folks, they can't die because God has sealed them, okay? So I believe these, there's two places here. It starts out on earth, uh, this scene, and then it goes to heaven. And so we need to remember that. And with him, 144,000, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. And again, folks, uh, just like when we get saved, all right, the Holy Spirit seals us. He says, you know, it, uh, you are mine. We are God's when we get saved. And you think about it. You know, we're in God's hands. We're in Jesus' hands. And then he seals all that. And for us not to be saved, and I will say this, once saved, truly saved, always saved. Because Matthew 7 says there are such things as false professions of faith. I made a false profession of faith when I was 14. I was under conviction of the Holy Spirit, but looking back, I did not give God all my life. I said, you can have most of it. Now, that's not what I prayed. I prayed the sinner prayer. But I'm telling you, if I would have died, in my personal opinion, between age 14 and age 22, I would have spent an eternity in hell. Why do you say that, Mike? Because that's what the Bible teaches, and we are going to show that just in a few minutes. His name, his father's name written in their uh, foreheads, and I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters. Again, this has been seen in Revelation 
before. So uh, like the voice of a loud thunder, and it is God speaking. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. Why would harpists play their harps? Okay, what does the Bible say? When somebody gets saved, what happens? Angels break out. In, in, and again, I, I'm not saying it's the hallelujah chorus, but I mean they break out in praise. And they sang it, saying as it, it were a new song before the throne. And again, you know, there were some rise, writers that said it was the song of Moses. Uh, some say it could have been the songs that were in Revelation 5 and Revelation chapter 7. But if we take this literally, which I do, folks, it is simply saying it is a new song, and I believe it has to do with what we would call the song of the redeemed. They are celebrating people getting saved. Because you have to realize when the Antichrist is in power, he is going to put a lot of Christians to death. But yet there will still be people saved. And you will see this in Scripture in just in a few minutes. And no one can learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They're the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed uh, from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. That is a long verse, and it says a lot of things. But basically it is talking about these, this 144,000 were set apart by God. He had a purpose for these 144. And they were to preach the gospel even while all this is going on, the bold judgments and the trumpet judgments, and all this was going on. He left 144,000. And I'm telling you, if the Antichrist could have, he would have killed them on the spot. But you think about Job, all right? God said you can do anything to Job that you want to do, but you can't kill him. And I'm saying we are under divine protection of God. You will not die one second before he says so. So don't worry about dying. Hey, let me give you a hint. We're all going to die. Okay? If you live long enough, you're going to die. And I'll, I'll give you some encouragement. I, don't, I know that doesn't sound encouraging, but at the end, I'll give you some encouragement. These were redeemed from among the men and the first fruits, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And the reason he tells these characteristics, I believe, in the book of Revelation, is because these are the things that we need to do. And when you look at the virgins and you look at marriage and you look all, you know, uh, you know he's simply saying that we need to stay uh, pure and holy. Listen to me, young people. Premarital sex is wrong. God doesn't want you doing that. The Bible tells us in Proverbs that our, our, our beds, our, our wedding beds, they need to be undefiled. And I don't even have to go in to the effects that premarital sex can have on you and your family. Don't do it. Save yourself. And that's what he's saying. These people were not perfect. These 144 were not perfect. But yet they were saved. They were sealed. They were God's finest messengers who brought hope, who brought the gospel and salvation, as you will see, to others. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's relate that to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us into a living hope. Folks, we have hope in Christ. The gospel is alive. The word of God is alive. And it says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Everything that we believe, our whole belief system is wrapped around Jesus rising from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, if you live long enough and, and even after you die, things around you, are not going to be the way they were. 
If you are a senior adult, let me help you here. You will realize things don't work like they used to. <laughs> Why? Because we are mankind. We wake up with ailments. Well, I didn't have that yesterday. Okay? And so it is with the world. This world is corrupt. This world will not last forever. Our inheritance is perfect. Our inheritance will be undefiled, according to verse 4, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And I'll tell you the other thing we do. We look every once in a while, senior adults, we look in the mirror and we'll say, man, what happened to you? <laughs> Where did you get those wrinkles all at once? Why do you have that gray in your beard? You didn't have it last year, all right? Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be re re revealed in the last time. Oh, folks, let me tell you something. The best is yet to come. I heard of the story of a man that was buried, and they opened his casket, and when the people filed by, he had a fork in his hand. And I thought, what? Is, what is it? Why a fork? And you think about it, because I'm a sweet holic. I'm a diabetic, and I don't know how that works. It really doesn't work well, to be honest with you. Why? Because to me, dessert is icing on the cake. And folks, I am telling you, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Folks, life is hard. Life is unfair. Men can be so cruel. Sin is so rampant right now. We are going to have trials. We are going to, but we have someone to go through those trials with us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us, that the genuineness of your faith be much more than precious gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're all going to go through storms in life. And I love that song. I'll praise you in the storms. Though sometimes all hell is breaking out around us, we are going to heaven. We can see it from a different perspective. We can be calm. We can be assured. We can have hope because who we are in Christ Jesus, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you have rejoiced with Joy, unexpressible, inexpressible, and full of glory. You want to get happy today? You lay in bed tonight, and you start picturing heaven. Thinking about who's going to be there. Thinking about the streets of gold, and thinking about, listen to me, no more temptation, no more sin. Man, that's going to be a great, great day. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And folks, these were sung, I believe, by martyred saints. Martyred saints. This new song in this particular place. The 144. And, and that song came from heaven. And it was the, the song of the redeemed. And I believe he was talking about the Mount Zion uh, in, just outside of Jerusalem. So we see the song of the 144,000. And folks, I cannot tell you, and I think you know if you've gone here very long, how important the music is to our church. It sets the table for the hearing of the word. Number two, the message of three angels. The message of three angels. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth. So this angel has an assignment, and he didn't name this angel, but if, if you, again, I can't say I know this for sure, but I think it would be one of the highest angels, and that would be either Michael or Gabriel, and I'm leaning towards Gabriel because he was a messenger. So he had a special message, even during the time of tribulation. And remember, in chapter 14, we're still looking ahead. These things are going to happen. He's given us a preview of what is ahead in chapters uh, 17 and in chapters 19. 
And it says, to preach to the gospel, to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of waters. So this loud angel said and presented the gospel and said, fear God, have reverence for God, honor God. Folks, I'm telling you, one of the things that drive me crazy is people that take God's name in vain. And I know a preacher shouldn't slap anyone. But in my mind, I'm thinking two things. Nobody disciplines you, and you are saying the words of the ignorant. You don't have to cuss me out to get my attention. And quit taking God's name in vain. Fear God. Respect God. Give him glory. We need to give him glory, folks. The hour of judgment has come. And they're getting to the, we're getting to the end of the tribulation period. And I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Jesus is going to come back. The second coming, the rapture of the church has already happened. And he's just waiting for these years to pass by in the tribulation and for more to be saved. Have you noticed in Revelation, that's the third time the gospel has been presented? He wants people saved, but yet people just, some people just put their fist up to God and says, I don't need you. I promise you, you need God. And you will need him for eternity. And if you don't trust in him, it says you will die and spend an eternity in hell. Now, I know that's not a popular thing to preach, but I'm, I, I'm just getting warmed up. It's, it's all down the road, all right? And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, Babylon is fallen. And when we think of Babylon, we can think of two things, either the city of Babylon, which by the way, some people think that uh, the Antichrist will ru rule from Rome, okay? That's, that is an opinion. Some thinks they're going to rebuild Babylon. But what I think this is talking about is the spirit of the Antichrist, which represents Babylon. Folks, the spirit of the Antichrist is everywhere. I mean, how can you kill somebody in cold blood? How can you kill children? Folks, I believe the hottest part of hell is saved for those people. It is terrible. There are degrees. Figure it out, folks. The Bible tells us that. And it says, Babylon has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink the wine of wrath of her fornication. And again, they're not necessarily thinking about, you know, sexual activity. Fornication is being, un, you know, uh, cheating on somebody, a type of cheating. And they've cheated on God. They've took the hook of the Antichrist. They've taken the mark of the beast. And I am telling you, they will regret that greatly. And then in verse 9, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And there are people who will just say, now what kind of God would do this? The same God who has given you a chance to be saved. The same God that he has given you the ability to hear the gospel of Christ. The same God that uh, through the Holy Spirit has put you in worship services and some people will just hold on to the back of their chairs or the Holy Spirit will be speaking and you just say, no, no, I'm not going to do it now. Well, folks, I, I'm just telling you, if you're not going to do it now, when are you going to do it? Look at what's going on. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, oh, folks, hell is real. Turn to Daniel chapter 12. I want, you, I want you to see some Old Testament. We always try to get Old Testament in. Daniel chapter 12, 
and it's the prophecy of the end time. At that time, Michael shall stand. And I believe Michael is protecting Israel. I believe his assignment from God is to protect Israel. And I got news for you folks, Israel's going to win. They're going to win. And it's not a thing of just being on, you know, whose side are you on? I tell you whose side I'm on, I'm on God's side. And God has said Israel is God's chosen people. And it says, the great prince who stands watches over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, talking about the tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Folks, that is prophecy going, I mean, right in front of our eyes, this is happening. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And it's talking about the Old Testament saints and those who have died, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting content. Folks, there's only two choices. It's heaven or hell. It's not a multiple choice question. It's not a, this is my opinion. You write an essay all day. The essay has been written, and it is the word of God. It is yes, amen, and so be it. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who uh, turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And folks, I am telling you, that brightness is the light of Jesus. And I pray to God that light has been turned on in your life. I pray to God that you have accepted Jesus Christ into your life. And you will live forever and ever. Now look at Luke 16. Luke 16. Luke 16. And it talks about the rich man and Lazarus. They both die. One goes to heaven. The other one goes to hell. The rich man died and was buried. Look at verse 23. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Four times they speak of Hades here. And folks, that was that holding place before the cross. Now, I'm, I'm just telling you folks, it, it's hell. And, and I talked to a young man one time, and he says, well, I really don't believe in hell, but if there was a hell, I'm probably going to go there, and so are all of my buddies. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to party and party and party. He was a college student, and I looked at him, and I says, could you give me a verse? Could you tell me where that is in the Bible? Well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. And to make a long story short, in Lawton, Oklahoma, he threw me out of his apartment. He said, I don't want to hear it from preachers. I don't want to hear what you have to say because I don't believe it. Well, folks, I'm telling you, that young man will stand before God and he will be judged. And he will be judged harshly according to the word of God. So we need to understand God protects his own. But I'm telling you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, four times in that text, it uses the word torment. Now, we who are going to heaven, we think, man, it's going to be great. It is. It's going to be forever. It will. We're going to have peace. There's not going to be no sin, no cancer, no heartache. It's going to be great. Well, the opposite is true with hell too, folks. It is going to be torment. It's going to be forever and ever. You're not going to get out. It's not going to ease up according to the word of God. So here he is saying twice, he says, the Antichrist is making the world drink that drink, that intoxicating drink of, hey, if it feels good, just go ahead and do it. Hey, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Take the mark. Man, I'll give you food. I'll give you clothing. I'll give you all these things. And I am telling you, our world has bought into that hook, line, and sinker. Look at verse 11. And the smoke from their torment ascends. Back in our text, Revelation 14, 11, ascends forever and ever, and they will have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark in his name. About the closest thing I could come to it is when I was really, really sick, 
and I was given 60 milligrams of steroids at a time. I would lay awake most of the night praying to God, God, knock me out. <laughs> Please knock me out. I even told him, I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I told him, you can go ahead and take me. And this is about, I mean, it's miserable is what I was trying to say. For, for months, I was just miserable because I was just being pumped full of steroids. But I'm telling you, hell is forever. And you do not want to go to that place. So you see the message of these angels. Now, verse 12, and here is the patience of the saints. And the word I like to use, and it's used in our Baptist faith and message, perseverance of the saints. Folks, I'm telling you, this is important that you know this, all right? I gave you once saved, always saved, once saved, truly saved, always saved. The Bible tells us that nothing can snatch you out of your Father's hand. The Bible tells us that my sheep hear my voice, and they will follow me, all right? And again, I know it's been hard up to this point, but verses 12 and 13 is the pers perseverance of the saints. Man, if, you, if you're saved, you're going. It doesn't mean you're not going to have troubles. doesn't mean you're not going to be persecuted. doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems. It simply says your faith was real and you living by your faith. And folks, every once in a while people doubt things. Every once in a while, you'll just get on a, a poor, you know, you know, those pity parties that you have that nobody will come to. <laughs> oh, woe is me. Woe is me. All right? I'm serving God. I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I can't even. And you fill in the blank. And folks, it's Satan. Satan discourages you. Since he can't take you to hell with, with him, he wants to discourage the saints. He don't want you happy. He don't want you to have joy in your life. I believe with all my heart, Christians should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. I think when they walk into a room, they and again, I know they don't glow, but I'm, I'm saying within two to three minutes, if they don't know you're a Christian, then you need to tell your face and you need to talk. Let them know you're saved. Let them know what Jesus has done for you. So here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Now, folks, these are things we need to do, okay? The angel was presenting the gospel, and that's the only time in the Word of God you will see an angel presenting the gospel. But it is our job to present the gospel. It is our job to lead people to Christ. And then we, we keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Folks, Jesus is everything to me. Jesus is Number one in my life, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the evening, Jesus all the time. And it says, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I kid you not, if somebody just, and I've said this before, if somebody come to me and said, I don't like what you're preaching, and pulls out a gun and puts it to my head, and they said, you need to, you either curse Curse God or die. I said, what, you're going to threaten me with heaven? <laughs> you know? I'm not afraid to die. I don't have a death wish. I really don't. But I'm telling you, the Bible says 365 times, do not fear. I'll be swift is that I'm going to be afraid of a person. Because to be absent from the body is to be present. Matter of fact, I'm going to shake his hand before he does it and say thank you, all right? <laughs> Just a joke, okay? Don't take some serious. <laughs> Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Folks, you need to be sure, to be sure that you're saved. Be sure. Two verses, 1 John 2. 1 John 2, just turn back a little bit. 1 John 2, one verse, ver verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. 
but they went out that they may be made manifest that none of them were of us. And I get weary, and I and man, I, I scratch my head when I hear testimony like this. Man, I served the Lord when I was young. I served the Lord hard. I did this and I did that. And then I just dropped out of church. Hadn't been to church in 45 years. You know, and I'm thinking, now wait a minute. Is that person? And again, folks, I'm not judging anybody. I'm just telling you what the Word says. There needs to be that hunger and that thirst for righteousness. There needs to be some kind of fruit in all that. So I'm just telling you, make sure you know. And in another scripture that just bothers me, it bothers me, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. Folks, being saved is not fire insurance. See, that's what I had when I was young. I, when I was five years old, a evangelist come in, and I remember he had a white suit on, which scared me, okay? And man, he's preaching, and he just, you know, took the tie off, took the, and spit, and man, he was carrying on. And I was sitting on the front row. I was on the front row. And I was just thinking, my goodness, what's wrong with this guy? So I went down, and I, I remember what I said. I told the preacher, I just don't want to go to hell. And folks, I'm telling you, after that, I couldn't tell you what was said. I couldn't tell you what happened. And folks, we have these near-death experiences. And folks, I'm just telling you, you need to understand salvation is real. You need to be able to go back to your point of salvation. You need to know that you know that you know because Jesus, these are Jesus' words. Jesus' words. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Sounds good. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I remember Bailey Smith. I'll never forget this statement. I heard him several times. Uh, at for Southern Dell City, and he came and preached revivals at our church. And I remember one invitation, and it's always rang in my ears. He said, if you live like hell, that's exactly where you're going to go. Whoa. Folks, I was a young youth minister, and I'd never heard a statement like that. But I'm telling you, folks, there is truth to that. Who you are, what you have done, you need Jesus Christ. You need to know that you surrendered all and that you know without a shadow of doubt if you died, you would go to heaven. Now, let's look back, and I'm, and I'm about finished. I want to give you some positive. I know it's just been hard, but folks, I'm just preaching the text, okay? Just preaching the text. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and their work, works follow them. Steve, I think you would agree. Cody, I think you would agree. I get tired in the work, but I never get tired of the work. Like some of you, y'all, you're helping me. You, you know, preacher, you can't keep doing that. You can't keep doing that. Well, just give me a chance, okay? That's who I am, all right? I have gotten more advice in the last year. I feel like I've sat on Dr. Phil's show for hours, <laughs> hours. I would rather burn out than rust out. Amen. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Amen, brother. Matthew 11. You know the text. I can find it. <laughs> Matthew 11, 28. Jesus says, come unto me. All you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Scott, I believe all with all my heart, we've got all of eternity to rest. 
And, and God gives you common sense. I mean, if, you're, if everything, man, your blood pressure's through the roof and all these things, but I'm just simply getting better, and I want to do everything I can while I can because I believe with all my heart that trumpet's going to sound real soon, and we're going to be out of here. And we need to tell people about Jesus. Second Timothy, man, that's good news. We got more good news. Second Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Folks, I want to be able to say that as a man of God. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Don't be afraid of the rapture, folks. If you're saved, it's going to be the best day of your life. Then Psalm 116, 15, you don't have to turn there. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious. Death. Hallelujah. I am telling you, death is not your enemy, folks. Satan's your enemy. And there's things worse than dying. There's things worse than that. That's living without Christ, living without hope, living without the assurance that if I died tonight, I would go to heaven. So folks, please check your life. Father, thank you for this day. and God, I thank you for revelation. and God, I know it's hard. It's just reading that. But God, it's, it's the Bible. It's true. It's yes and amen. And God, I just pray if there's anyone here that's not sure, they can't say 100% that they're going. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict them this day. And God, I pray that they would come forward and simply say, I need Jesus. I am not sure I'm saved. I need to confess my sins and repent of my sins. I need to make sure. And Lord, also, there's Christians here. The 144 was our example. We need character. We need purity. We need holiness. We need joy in our lives. So I pray for the Christian that has lost that joy, that is not happy in their own skin, and they worry about everything. God, I pray that they would trust you for everything in life. Maybe somebody needs to come forward for baptism or join the church. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. God, we give it to you. God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for what you've done, and we thank you for what you're going to do. So, God, I pray that we would just be obedient during this time of invitation. We open the altars. We open the altars to pray. Maybe somebody just needs to come down and pray. God, it's your time. This is your church. You choose, and you do with it what you want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? Would you come if God's spoken to you?